Mm-hmm. All right. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome all of you on a warm August summer night where we're going to be talking tonight about poetry. And Jian Lee will be telling us all about it. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have our speaker who will speak for up to an hour or thereabouts. After, I'm sorry, first we have our announcements period. Then our speaker, Jian, will speak. Then we will have a question and answer period. And then after our question and answer period, we will then have our infamous rebuttal period where you will then be able to speak on or off subject about the stuff. We generally will be uh, finishing up about nine o'clock or so, unless you guys want to keep going because we are not at a restaurant. We're still on Zoom, but I'll keep the call open in case anybody wants to talk later on about about our subjects. So with that, there are two rules at the college. One is one fool at a time, and two is no personal attacks. And while we're on Zoom, it's still relatively a, a calm place, but personally, I can't wait to meet live again, but that'll come soon enough. Um, with that, Charlie, uh, I know you got announcements, and if anybody else does, please let us know. Uh, Charlie, go ahead, and I'll be ready with the schedule here in a second when you're all set. All right, I'm all set. Uh, welcome to meeting number 3,630 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, as usual, we have a relatively new Google group, email group, which you are is recommended that you sign up for to get notices of upcoming announcements. Uh, also, there is a meetup group in which you will get only two notices per week uh, of upcoming programs. So I highly recommend that you sign up for those and then you'll know what exciting topics we're going to be covering. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Next Saturday, October the 28th, you mean August Ben Bolger will be returning and helping us decide between nuclear energy or renewables. So it should be an interesting program. I think we're gonna lay this debate to rest once and for all. That's what okay, I'm hoping October to do so. The September the 5th. Uh, in conjunction, we have always a special Labor Day speaker, Mark Burroughs, who's uh, the secretary of the Railway Workers United and the union historian. He's spoken on Eugene Debs. Uh, he will be talking about the organized labor movement and our accomplishments and challenges. I must say, I've been part of the accomplishments part of that. That's for sure. Okay, on September the 11th, mm. October the 11th, Jim Fisk, who is in charge of the founder of the Academics for Truth, will be talking about 9-11, bringing us up to date with a topic entitled Reality, or illusion? That's a question every one of you can ask yourself. Are you dealing with reality or illusions in your lives itself, I think? On September the 18th. On September the 18th. Green America, uh, which is a nationwide organization. Um, originally Co-op America, uh, and they put out a nationwide publication and they have a mission and goals. Uh, we'll be sending uh, uh, one of the editors to speak to us on ecological environmental issues. On September the 25th, uh, an author will be returning, Michael Comerford. Uh, he did a tour of the United States, I believe in Canada and Mexico uh, at the height of the pandemic, uh, ascertaining what was 
uh, going on in those various parts of the country. So that's on September the 25th. Uh, we have one other uh, program we just scheduled and that's in mid-October, October the 16th. And the topic will be senior fraud prevention, whether it's in person, over the phone, or online. Uh, he's from the College of DuPage. Mr. Brady is associate professor, has a weekly radio program uh, regarding fraud, frauds and so forth that he uh, was broadcasting. Now, if you'd like to speak yourself, the next open date, is October the 2nd. Please contact me with a description if you would like to speak. And that's it, uh, uh, Tim, take it away. All right, I just wanna let you know too that uh, on, on, um, on Thursdays right now, Dallas is meeting and they're having, uh, they meet on Thursday nights and they're having uh, some presentations. Uh, upcoming programs. I don't know why it's going to March 14th here, but it's. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant to do upcoming programs. We're in the lecture library. Yeah, I know. I'm just clicking to the. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to uh, Texas campus. Here we go. They're going to be uh, speaking on Thursday, the 26th, on healthcare and its importance, Labor Day, and the core progressive movement on September 2nd. And they are looking for speakers as of September 9th. You can contact Tom Barry or John Beasley. Their emails are right there. And of course, they too have a video library. But um, their is next update, on the plate as well. Yes, it is. They'll get them updated. Everything will be updated in another week. Oh. And I will promise I'll have them up by then. It's, it's coming. So I've been working on it. All right. Anyway, uh, there we go. Um, Xi'an Lee, anybody else have any announcements real quick before we get started? If not, Jean, the floor is yours. You can go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you. You know the share screen works, and uh, yeah, we're interested to hear about poetry tonight. Thank you. Oh, did you have any block in that bad clean? This is just amazing. That's the only one of us to get apart. Oh, okay. can people who are not speaking mute? Yeah, well, we'll all mute if we're, if we're not speaking. So. One of those three things out there. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, the the title is talking. Beauty, Truth, and the Fractals. And yeah, I'm going to mute everybody else life. here in case uh, <laughs> we're going to start muting everybody here so that, yeah. uh, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, so I have uh, prepared uh, two of my favorite po uh, poets and my reflections on their poems and their philosophical messages. Uh, I'm not going to read a poem. Um, I think you have probably all read this famous poem, but there's a really beautiful video um, I want to show you to refresh your memory and to show you the beauty of the poem and beauty of the scenery. Can you see the video? Sometimes no, you gotta share it. You gotta share your screen. Yeah, with that. I have to stop and reshare. Yeah. I have to reshare. Reshare your desktop. Yeah. So okay, now you can see. Okay. So it's really beautiful um, pictures and the re readings. Then took the other as justice fair and 
to having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though, as for that, the passing there had really warned them about the same. And both that morning equally lay in the leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Have you all read this poem before? In I, I've, I've been in familiar with it myself. Remember parts of the poem? Um, Go ahead I, and unmute if you want to comment. Yeah, we learned it in elementary school. Uh huh. Wow, even in elementary school. So mm -hmm. um, this 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 poem you can read it literally or symbolically. Um, when he wrote it, it, the story went that he actually went. Um, took walks with a friend who kind of hesitates um, in making decisions and uh, really like not, not wanting to decide which, which fork um, to, 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 to take. Um, but um, a lot of people take it as symbolically as a life that uh, we might have two choices in careers, in relationships, and you took one and it, it made all the difference, right? But you would not really know if what would happen what would, uh, if you took the other way. So it, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a poem that um, it's kind of, popular and um, people have different interpretations. Um, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later on. I want to introduce the second one. Um, this is less well-known and I, I think I read it um, 30 years ago, 30, 30, 40 years ago. And it kind of stuck in my mind and I thought it's kind of unusual. Um, and there is a video that will give you more vision. With interest rates at historic lows, putting your money to work is harder than ever. The Yield Street Short Term Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. It's kind of unusual um, poem, right? Um, most poems kind of talk about um, beauty and love, and this actually talks about uh, destruction. Um, talk about destruction and talk about um, two ways of destruction. The desire, oh. and desire is related to fire. Uh, you have... Uh, intense desire for something. It's like you have lit a fire. Um, but desire and a fire can destroy the world just as um, ice um, and hate and ice. But 
really from the po this poem, there's uh, no really no judgment and no not saying one is better or worse than the other. Um, both of them have the power to to destruct. And uh, if we think uh, now, whether personal life or global warming, um, it is the the intensity of uh, fire or ice that can lead to destruction. So Robert Fro Frost, um, he's from uh, New England and uh, his uh, writing actually is kind of uh, colloquial. So it's easy to understand. Um, he, uh, in his poems, he explore some complex social and philosophical themes like the two poems that I've shown. And he actually has been well-known, um, one of the most well-known American po poets. So he, he was the only poet to uh, receive four Pulitzer Prizes for, for poetry. And one of the reasons that his po poems are so well known because he, his poems has uh, local roots, um, but has a universal appeal. Um, as I mentioned, my first exposure to Robert Frost was in the early 1980s when I was undergraduate in, in Shanghai, but my major was um, English and British, like British English literature, language and literature. So um, Robert Frost was one of the main uh, points that was introduced in my class. And I was always impressed by the beauty and the simpl simplicity of the la language. Um, and you see in both po poems of the two roads and um, fire and ice, there's duality, um, uncertainty, beauty, contemplation, and the non-judgmental. He is not saying one road is better than the other or fire is better than ice, it's, it is what it is. Um, and it, his poem has a sense of wonder, wonder of nature, wonder of um, life. Um, and I, thought if you um, delve deeply, you can um, kind of have your own imaginations of how it is pertinent to our personal lives, um, national and global. Um, there are many choices that facing us as an individual, facing mm -hmm. us as a nation, facing us as a global community, uh, especially now. Uh, I would think um, the climate change, global warming has a far, re far uh, reaching impact on the future of humanity than even um, the wars and conflicts. Um, uh, water of survival uh, is really intimately related to the environment. And these are global issues. So if you think like the choices we can make, make um, and a, a global reach. So the poems, it's kind of general, but um, it does have, um, implications if you think um, deeply into it. My um, second, uh, one of my favorite po poets is William Blake. Um, his poems is philosophical and even kind of has it's a deep uh, spiritual religious quest. And actually the poem of this- The Tiger by poem, William Blake. Actually- Tiger, tiger, actually, burning bright. 
in the forests of the this night. The second poem. What immortal hand or eye could trace that beautiful okay. symmetry? Are you seeing this? In what distant deeps was? I was not. I didn't intend. Do you still see the uh, poem? Let me share. We were seeing the poem. Yeah. Here it comes. Here we got yeah. it. Yeah, four I lines. To use this poem first um, to see what in a grain of scent. And this is one of the most like well-known po poem by him. Um, let me see, I'll just copy and paste because I'm not in that mode. Uh, um, let me see, I need to reshare the screen for some. No waste. No equipment. No problem. This is JVYV. Just bring. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. Oh, okay. I'm Robert That's a long ago. And I'm Audie Cornish. Commentator and NPR blogger Adam Frank is a scientist, an astrophysicist to be exact. And part of the joy he finds in science is that it helps us slow down and pay attention to the beauty in the minutia of life. It's a notion he's going to explore over the next year. And today, Adam lays out the big picture. More than two centuries ago, the great poet William Blake offered the world the most extraordinary of possibilities. To see a world in a grain of sand, he wrote, and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Yeah, that would be nice. Unfortunately, most of us don't know how to hold eternity in the palm of our hands. In fact, most of us feel lucky if we can just hold it together until the end of the day. The problem, of course, is that mostly we've lost our minds. Appointments, to-do lists, worry, concern, and agitation make up modern life. Sometimes, however, for the briefest moment, we do pick up a scent that there is something more going on than this daily round of survival. But those moments pass, and the waves of mundane urgency swallow us again. Tumbling through the chaos of our day-to-days, we wonder if Blake's vision of a broader, more expansive experience is nothing more than a poet's fancy. Can we really see the universe in a grain of sand, even as we slog through traffic? Can we really hold infinity in our hands, even as we drop off the kids to violin practice? The answer, I believe, is yes. In fact, I'm sure the answer is yes. The connection between the everyday reality we experience and boundless landscapes of cosmic beauty, inspiration, and joy is actually so close, so present for us. It's there in the dust on your car. It's there in the mess on your desk and the swirling water in your sink. How do I know this? Because I'm a scientist, damn it. And I know that science, under all its theories, equations, experiments, and data, is really trying to teach us to see the sacred in the mundane and the profound in the prosaic. The trick is in the noticing. And that happens by unpacking the question hidden in Blake's poem. Can we really see the whole world in a grain of sand? Through the lens of science, we can see how even the smallest thing can be a gateway to an experience of the extraordinary if only we can practice noticing. We walk past a thousand, thousand natural miracles every day, from the sun climbing in the sky to the arc of birds seen out our windows. Those miracles are there, waiting for us to see them, to notice them, and most importantly, to find our delight in theirs. You want some transcendence? I got it for you. Let's start with that grain of sand. Adam Frank is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Rochester and author of About Time, Cosmology and Culture at the Twilight of the Big Bang. Stay tuned for more of his essays about witnessing science in everyday life, such as How to Meet Einstein on your next episode. to change my uh, Hi, I'm Jonah with High Spirits Flutes. And this now I've lost okay, let me see. I have different windows open. So now I'm you can you can hear me, right? Okay, I need to go back. 
to this and share this. <laughs> so I thought it's an extraordinary uh, talk that um, slide, um, how the astrophysicist appreciate this um, poem by uh, seeing the connection between between um, a small nature object like sand, a, a sand, a leaf, a white flower, it, uh, it contains the whole uh, universe and not only contain the universe that if we pay attention, then we also appreciate the moment of beauty and moment of life as if we own the whole world. Um, and that is uh, another form of divinity and a spirituality. Um, if you truly can see the beauty, um, you can see beauty in, in the mundane, um, then you will not be too much troubled by the daily grinds of life. Um, so this uh, William, William Blake, he uh, is also a painter, print uh, maker, an artist and prophet. So these two um, pictures are actually painted by William Blake. Um, and you can see um, that he, this, uh, this man kneeling um, and on top probably is a vision of the universe, right? So we are part of the universe and uh, by kneeling in front of universe, like he is humbling himself and not like uh, I'm the greatest, uh, but we are just a small pack. We are small scent in the universe and the, the title of oh I'm changing it doesn't go well now so I actually actually I was going to show you the other poem so this poem the tiger is also one of the uh, very well known um, uh, poems. Um, Probably I'm not going to show you the, the video. It's long and uh, I'll have to come back. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Um, I think this is well known both for its language and its message, like um, the rhythm of bright night, eye, um, and gives you an uh, image of uh, wonder and even terror, uh, um, fearful symmetry. But it's imagery of immortal hand or eye. Immortal, what is immortal? And usually immortal is related to God, not to the divine. Um, and usually when we think about in a Western tradition, uh, God um, usually create like lamb. So in his, uh, in this longer version, he also had uh, a spencer on, on lamb, um, kind of cuddly, uh, peaceful. But on the other hand, um, the immortal hand could also create something um, Fearful, huh? fearful, terrible, even um, very um, extraordinary. So that now count back to this. Um, so these are the two uh, pieces of paint that painted by William Blake. So he is a very good artist um, as well. And I think the reason that they say he is also a prophet. Um, his um, 
poem about um, his poem about the to see the world in a gray of scent and now um, has been interpreted by uh, scientists to see how the interconnections of um, natural world and human world um, into one, um, interpreted in many different ways, including the uh, fractal, the um, concept of fra fractal, which I hope I'll show you that it, a short video too. Um, this is, uh, okay. So the thought of um, interconnection of our world is expressed in different cultures. And there's a Buddhist poem uh, on the one side is Chinese character, on the other side is a translation. It's the idea is very close to, uh, to uh, Blake's poem. Um, a, a world in a flower. You can see a flower um, that contains all the elements of the world. A life in a tree, a Buddha in a leaf, a paradise in a scent. If one day you can see <laughs> all these in the mundane, in the ordinary life, then you'll be um, in a transcendental place, in a very spiritual place, a happy place, um, maybe not every day, but even moments of that beautiful world. Um, that will be a good place that I want to be. What do they have in, in co common? Um, so there's aesthetic, aesthetically, it's simple images and elegance. Um, philosophically, it's um, similar to the system theory, which um, talks about interrelatedness of the parts and the whole. Uh, spiritually, it, it evokes transcendence and a, and a divinity, divine insight to, to life, man, manifestation of the web of life, of which we are all part of it. So the frac fractals, when I was doing some research about a poem, I saw, uh, I saw, I think that's a TED, TED talk about fractals and uh, um, this poem is also invoked. So let me read. <laughs> Was Venice Beach before? Two hundred years ago, William Blake wrote this verse To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Now, poetry is often subject to interpretation, but I think we can all agree that this poem is about fractals. And that's pretty impressive because, because fractals weren't discovered until 170 years later. But Blake's poem captures something essential about the natural world around us. It draws a connection between the very large and the very small. And it observes that similar patterns can occur at vastly different scales across time and space. And we see this in the universe around us, similar patterns from the shape of immense spiral galaxies to the weather patterns of a hurricane to little eddies in a stream and whenever you have a single object that contains these patterns repeating over and over again at many different scales and where every small part 
resembles the whole, that's a fractal. And we see them around us everywhere from the jagged shapes of lightning bolts to the rough ragged edges of coastlines. But fractals are not just outside of us. Our lungs are fractals. That's how they manage to pack the surface area of a tennis court folded down into your rib cage. And our circulatory system is a fractal as well, which is how 60,000 miles of branching blood vessels and capillaries fit inside every human being. So I'm able to stand here and talk to you today because I'm a living, breathing fractal, and so are you. But for hundreds of years, these complicated geometric shapes were swept under the rug. They were considered too complicated to mathematically analyze uh, because they don't behave like circles or squares or triangles. And the assumption was that any explanation for these shapes would have to be as complicated as the shapes themselves. Because ordinarily, simple things have simple explanations and complex things have complex explanations. But every once in a while, something comes along that breaks the mold. Take the universe. A hundred years ago, there was a crisis in physics. Measurements of the natural world weren't working out the way that scientists expected. And physicists were tying themselves in knots, coming up with more and more convoluted theories, trying to explain away these discrepancies. But then this guy showed up with a very simple equation. And this led to the discovery of the theory of relativity and opened up an entire new era in physics. 70 years later, geometry was in a similar crisis because mathematicians still couldn't explain the property. Well, it is a little bit long, so I don't want to um, show the whole video. If you're interested, you can Google the fractals and TED Talk. Uh, I can also email you the link, link. but you get an idea why, um, why William Blake is also considered as a prophet because um, after so many years now, even scientists I talk about the concept that uh, shared with um, William Blake's poem. Um, all these images are fractals. That's the, 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 the small part, um, what sometimes we call microcosm, um, is embodied in the microcosm, in the very small and the very big. Um, in a sand, very small, you see the universe, right? Um, a leaf, you see also the whole um, seasons and uh, na nature. So um, it not only has uh, its poetic beauty, but it inspires you to see the whole connection between um, us and the nature and also the nature of the nature. So it's really profound. Um, and now uh, I'm kind of, I, I want to talk about why um, I'm interested in these poems and why I decided to do a talk like this. Uh, I, how many years ago, maybe, four or five years ago, I have made a conscious decision to shift from seeking truth to seeking beauty. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not interested in seeking truth. It only uh, means I think it is um, more desirable, at least for me, to uh, to shift from seeking truth to beauty. Why? Because when we seek truth, usually it is binary, which means true or false, right or wrong. And because that mentality, we uh, create a lot of conflict, uh, especially in the political uh, climate of today, you see people, people argue a lot, but you don't really convince the other side much. We are living in the echoing chamber. Um, I know that 
Dallas College of Complex um, used to have people from left and right. Now, people from right kind of all have left. So they probably split into their own. They even don't want to participate in a dialogue. Um, so I, um, so I think it is not really constructive if you see the world as binary, there's true of both right and wrong. Whereas when we seek beauty, it's an open system. It is soothing and it's life affirming. So let's look at these two pictures, two roads diverged in the yellow woods. And one picture is more like, like there are two, two roads, um, you can take left, you can take right. Whereas um, on the right side, at least from my side, it's all right. So it, it, it's the nature and in a poem, the two roads diverged in the yellow woods. And I took the one that's left, less traveled by. But the author didn't say, I wish I had taken the other one, um, the, the, the one that has uh, less trodden by is a better, or the one that uh, is trodden black is better. It, life is such that you can't always say, which one is true, which one is false, which one's better, which is not. Even if you pay a price for the decision that you have made, you still will learn a lesson if you reflect, right? So we may not always make a, the best decision, but if we reflect, we can learn something from any decision that we have made. So just as I was thinking like, oh, I want to shift from seeking truth to seeking beauty, then um, it reminded me of this poem by John Keats, which says beauty is truth and truth is beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you should know. So if, of course, that's a big if that we can kind of combine beauty and truth together. What would that be? It would be a perfect world. But of course, that's the ideal that we may not arrive all the time, maybe momentarily. And um, um, some people, one of the interpretations that says the, the um, ingredients that put beauty and truth together is the goodness. If we have the goodness um, within us, it's possible that we can um, combine beauty and truth together. I haven't really worked out this, but that's an ideal that I like to strive for. Uh, more reflections on truth, beauty, and fractals. So truth. When we say truth, um, there's the big T truth. There's a small um, capital truth, and there's a plural truth. So the capital T truth is a truth that implies there's only one truth, um, right or wrong. But in, in life, there uh, might be many truths. A small t truth means that truth is conditional um, by time and space, right? So there are different time, the truth may be different, even if you study a religious text. Um, the, the truth can be relevant, say, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, but may not be, that may not be uh, as true today. So there are many truths that are kind of relative to time and space. And also 
um, I think sometimes there are more than one truth. So we need to be patient and to listen and to learn different points of view. Um, and beauty is also an uh, uh, interesting, difficult topic. Uh, is beauty uh, objective, subjective? Um, some people say beauty is in the eyes of beholder. That means it's subjective. Um, but on the other hand, um, most people will think a beautiful sunset is, a be is beautiful. Uh, flowers, um, beautiful. Um, but without human perception of the flower or the sunset, is that beautiful? If it is what it is, a beautiful is we interpret as it is, but without our perceiving the nature is what it is. I would think there's not beauty without being perceived as such. So uh, in a way it's the uh, interconnections of what is out there and uh, what is our perception of the, uh, the object. And uh, fractals, um, fractals, the lessons from, from fractals is, is that we are all part of the whole. We can see uh, from a scent, a leaf, a flower. Um, we can see the universe in a little object. And we can also see ourselves as part of the humanity, ourselves as part of the universe. Um, and that's what, um, I, I'm reading the poems and thinking about how relevant it is to the growth of our mi mindset. Um, the seeds yearning to grow and to connect uh, that if one of the meanings, if, if there's a meaning of life um, is that uh, we can consider ourselves as seeds, um, learn to grow and to connect. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. So again, as choices and decisions. And once we made a decision, um, we should accept our decision and not too much attached to the two possibilities and regret the one that we didn't make. Um, we need to let go and be free. So you'll be happier that way. Um, so these are the things that I've mentioned before. Um, there's this um, a scent, a flower, a leaf, um, these are microcosm that embedded in a microcosm in the big universe. And there's interconnectedness of nature, of human society and of human and the nature. Um, it teaches the lesson of humility and a growth. When we have a sense of humility, we will grow if we think we hold ultimate truth, then um, we get stuck. Okay, so that's all I have. Okay, Xian uh, uh, Lee, that, that is a good lecture in, in poetry and I appreciate uh, your uh, uh, indulgences a little bit. Um, I know about fractals. I've I've watched them for a long time, and I know they some produce some good mathematical patterns. All right, we're now going to open it up to uh, questions. And who's got a question for Jian Lee? 
Oh, Gian, if you don't, if you first, if, if 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 you don't, don't mind, what got you interested in uh, poetry and and fractals and the other things like this? It sounds like you've had quite a passion for them for quite a long time. If you care to give us a little I, bit, of well, I actually, I'm I'm kind of uh, interested in big ideas, and I see some big ideas in the poem that sometimes it kind of come back to me and I think about them. And also, as I mentioned that I made a conscious decision to shift from seeking truth to beauty. And these poems are kind of reminder of um, the value of seeking beauty and the interconnectedness of, of um, humans and with nature. So it's more, uh, actually it's more of lessons that I feel like uh, I have learned from reflecting on the poems rather than poems as piece of literature. It's more of connecting um, ideas and inspirations. Uh, who else has a question? No question. I just wanted to say, <clears throat> Jen, I actually heard you in the Dallas College, but I had to come again because this is so beautiful. Well, Margaret, mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what, uh, since you're there, Margaret, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you thought from her from the Dallas presentation? It was very similar. And of course, I was not aware of fractals till say 10 years ago. And I don't know much about them. I, I have a very poor mathematical concepts, but it just made such sense and such beauty. And today we were at the Perot, the uh, Perot Museum and see, saw a lot of this. And the other thing, uh, Jean, uh, first Unitarian contracted with a woman named uh, Tondeaka, who was very much into the interconnectedness of the web of all of life, which you've spoken of. And this is not just her idea. Yeah. But I just I, I just found it extremely inspiring. And I don't remember, I'm sure we read Robert Frost when I was a student at Woodrow, but I didn't even realize that he actually was alive then. And William Blake I always considered to be a mystic. Very interesting. I'd like to ask a question. Go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, Jan, uh, you uh, claim that there are multiple many truths and you disavow this truth and uh, instead for beauty i'd like to know how you cross the street you, you say oh it's a sunny oh it's a beautiful day i mean how do you disavow truth and you say there's multiples mm -hmm. so as you say it's a beautiful i mean is that a speeding car or is that car not speeding? It's it's slow. So if if you say it's a beautiful day, so let's just say when it's a raining day, and some people think raining day is beautiful, and some people think it's it's really dreadful. So which one is true? It is beautiful or it is dreadful? A rainy. How do you cross the street? What do you mean across the street? So, so some people street? can be so terrified crossing a big street and they never want to cross a big street. And some people get excited to cross a big street. So which one is true, which one is not true? It, it, a lot of things are depending on the perspectives. Um, even, well, even like now we say that climate change, um, some people deny, well, I probably shouldn't say make this because I think climate change is true and global warming is true, but there are people who deny and they think it's a natural cycle of uh, na nature. Um, there are things, I guess there are things that, um, are most likely true. And there are things are more perceptions. Like if I say like today is very hot, uh, 100 degrees. And there are people who love hot, hot weather. Um, 
you cannot argue today is 100 degree, but you can argue if it's better to be 100 degree or minus mm -hmm. five degrees. So may, maybe like is fire better or ice better? Um, so there are things that can be multiple truths and multiple interpretations. Um, does life have a meaning? When I watch the weather report, I watch factual data. I don't watch the opinion <laughs> of the of some guy. Actually, factual. I, I want to know the data. I got to know yeah. rain or if it's raining or not. I, I, I binary. You like binary systems. I don't like. I, I kind of like you know one or uh, the other. Yeah. So. Um... There are actually things that binary are quite boring. Things are kind of um, fuzzy actually has more potential yeah. uh, for exploration. Uh, for uh, like poems, poems are different from uh, political debate. You don't really debate on poems because it's an open system, but you can debate on politics because people think that they have the truth. They have the wow. truth. So the debate always goes on and most of the time they don't really go anywhere. Okay. All, all right. Uh... Anything else, Charlie? Because uh Well, I just don't think a speeding car is a matter of the if a speeding car is dangerous, that's not a matter of opinion. Well, we know that, but uh you're you you tend to uh hold the uh, various untruths in your head all the time, like about the validity of how free markets work and about how your uh anti nuclear views on climate change, you know. I just right. gotta get across the street. Well, people get across the street all the time. They either use a signal, they look for speeding cars and just- I'm not going to ask a bullet, that's for sure. You know, Charlie, how about this? Poet laureate or bureaucratic nitwit? <laughs> Michael, go ahead. And then we'll get to you, Vicky, next. Unmute, Michael. <laughs> Don't forget to unmute, Michael. Ah, okay. Yeah, Jen, I appreciated your uh, poetry and so forth. You mentioned uh, philosophy and whole and part. Um, uh, are you aware of the uh, field of mirology? Mirology has to do with, it's a study of whole and part in philosophy. And I was very impressed uh, when you uh, mentioned um, philosophy as whole and part. I've done um, a book on uh, mirology and whole and part. And with uh, with fractals, uh, how familiar are you with the concept of uh, whole and part? Uh, uh, parts being reductionist and um, wholes being non-reductionist. Uh, I have heard of it, but I don't really know. But I didn't argue that whole uh, part uh, is reductionist or not. I I only say that. We are uh, all parts in a whole. We, it's the interconnectedness of parts of whole, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, keep them separate. They are actually very much as part of it. So that's how the grain of scent, you can see the whole world in the grain of scent is the interconnectedness rather than a separate, separate separation. Um, so I think one lesson from reading poem is to have insight that we are more connected than we are apart. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. And uh, yeah, I was just very impressed when you mentioned part and whole. And I 
I was just wondering how much work you've uh, done on that because uh, it's uh, very technical stuff in uh, metaphysics. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's, um, I was very impressed when I heard you talk about that. Actually, um, I haven't really studied in depth and I used to study a little bit about Chinese medical theory and um, the Chinese medical theory is also um, also has that philosophy that um, like if you're sick, you're probably um, out of balance. That's um, like acupuncture. If you have uh, a headache, they don't treat your head, but they treat your whole system. When your whole system is restored to balance, then your health is restored to balance. Um, so it's not like, like if, if you have back pain, it's a back pain problem. It probably, the problem is somewhere else because your whole body is a system. And if you want to get to the root of your problem, you have to know your problem as a system and which aspect of system is out of whack. And you have to bring the, the, the system into balance then, um, then you, you kind of treat the root of the health issue rather than just like headache, a backache. It probably has psychological, it probably has um, some other issues related to it, right? So that's kind of part and whole um, theory that I have thought about before. Did you also mention, um, unless I misread, did you also mention systems theory? Yeah, I, I mentioned systems theory. Uh, um, I know a little bit about systems theory that also implies the, the theory of um, the relatedness of parts and whole um, without knowing the different the parts in the system, you will never know the whole whole system. Um, and I remember, well, actually, I was in some other discussions, and there were, I used to uh, participate in a um, Chinese um, Taoism uh, discussion that we talk about um, parts and whole and the systems and a body, a human body as a system, uh, the universe is a system, and we all partake um, in the cosmic rhythm of the world. So my, my interest and knowledge is more philosophical than like uh, scientific, um, because my, my field is not like physics, uh, math, but more like uh, social sciences. But I'm interested in scientific method, but I don't really know the details of science. Thank you. Can I? Sure. Yeah, Vicki, I'm sorry. I, I did. Yeah, please go right ahead. <laughs> you forget me. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to forget you. I'm. Uh, looking at my other computer here about a couple of poems that have inspired me over the years. And I found okay. a couple that I might share in a rebuttal period. And I was just drifting away for a brief minute or two, Jian. So, Oh no, but I I've had it up for a I long know, Vicky, time. Vicky, Vicky, I know you've had it up for a long time. So <laughs> I said, go next. And, uh, you know, like right, I said, sure. I'm, I'm quite sure, intrigued I, I, by this lecture and, uh, thinking about my rebuttal tonight, what I'm going to share. And I think I got something good for, Gian Lee, somewhat hilarious, but uh, so so go ahead and lower your hand and let's get right into the uh, back and forth. Okay, I'll lower my hand. Uh, I can okay. do it for okay, that's good. No, I did. <laughs> um, I really love I love this talk and you've given me a lot to think about. When I see a poet use the word truth, I'm not always sure what he and it's usually he means and I think of it not in terms sometimes as true or false in a fact 
is in effect, as you mentioned, the subjectivity of the rainy day or the sunny day being beautiful. Um, but I think of a kind of artistic truth as in true to nature, um, authentic versus inauthentic, real versus uh, artificial. You know, I've heard some actors declaim and they're bombastic and it's forced and it's not true to nature. And I, there's poetry that's doggerel and it's just silly rhymes and it doesn't touch us or reach us. And I'm wondering if that's a valid interpretation. Keats equating beauty and truth. Oh. I'm not all altogether sure what he means, although then that brings up Blake. Uh, what a mortal hand or eye dared frame my fearful symmetry. Um, the symmetry, it to me indicates a kind of proportionality that is true, that is true to, to, to nature. And if beauty then is a kind of I don't know, proportionality. I'm sorry, this is a bit of a ramble, but yeah. take it where All right. you will. <laughs> well, there, there, is a, there, there is a strong argument of symmetry is, uh, is an indication of beauty, um, um, whether in nature or in humans that they think symmetry uh, is an indicator of uh, beauty, but the, but you can always find not necessarily everything beautiful that's like symmetrical, although that, that is kind of a, a argument. But I like your, your um, authenticity. I think there, there are many different kinds, levels of truth. There, there is, um, I, I would think the, the more um, like in nature, it's easier to say, uh, like in mathematical equations, there's more like truth in that. You cannot argue with math, right? But in human societies, most things, it's kind of difficult to, to, to say that is true, but you, do, you can say it's more authentic. So in, in that sense, like I would, say that I want to live in an authentic life, um, not a truthful, right? So authentic, authenticity is something you can say true, but some other people might think it's not true for them. So it's, it's better to use authentic. It's authentic to me, may not be authentic to, to you. So at least like we can all strive to live a authentic life and being um, truthful to ourselves without imposing that our views on other people. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, yeah, can I get a second one or? Yeah, uh, go I'll ahead. Wait. We're, 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 oh, okay. Nobody else is actually actively looking right now, but so okay. keep talking. This is what it's there for. And uh, if anybody okay. else Good. wants to go it's next after Vicky, go next. About, um, to me, the hardest poem today was the fire and ice mm -hmm. one. I, I had not seen it before. Um, or heard it. And I mean, he begins by saying the world can end with fire or ice, and he expresses a preference for fire. But then he brings in having seen enough of hate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he is connecting the hate to the fire or the hate to the ice or either one, if the symbolizes something? No, I, I think he did equate ice with hate and desire with, with fire. But, oh, it, but, okay. 
but it doesn't mean one is better than the other. They are actually like like yin and yang. They are not just because both fire and ice, they can destruct, they have destructive power. They have equal destructive power. So if the world will end twice, I think ice will suffice. He doesn't mm -hmm. really have a preference. He, he, he said, if I have to choose now today, I'll say fire. But if the world had to, to be destroyed twice, ice is just as well, can destroy. But it, it, it's kind of difficult for me to, in a sense that thinking about destruction, um, which is better, fire or ice, they are equally. I maybe um, it's a warning that um, the world can be destroy destroyed by fire, by desire. In fact, global warming is probably uh, to a large degree is caused by our desire, our desire of having too much. We are using a lot of energy and we are destroying the environment. So it's fire is no better than ice. It, it, it's probably a warning of wanting too much. Mm. That's interesting because I've so much associated um, hate with fire rather no, than ice, ice, but someone can be angry in a fiery way or angry in a very cold and aloof right. way. Right. You know, my Scandinavian maybe in father would be quite aloof and silent when he was angry, whereas my mother was very uh, hot tempered. Yeah. And so I was kind of reading into that, but I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know Question which for one. Vicky, which one was more effective? Uh, I'm more used to imagery around fire. <laughs> Uh -huh. Actually, I mean, I think Scandinavian countries may have a hell um, that's kind of cool rather than a fiery hell. I, I, different cultures have different, you know, imagery around the end of times. Okay, we've had two participants who've uh, raised hands. Janice, you haven't gone yet, so please go and then we'll get to you, Charlie. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Jian, um, she, came, she said she came from Shanghai, uh, which I think is sort of Southern in China. And she came to Chicago. Um, I don't know whether that was a direct trip or not, but I, as a language teacher, I taught Russian language and I know how hard it is to learn a new language Although when you're in the country, I guess it's easier because you hear it all the time. So I'm just wondering how Jian mastered the English language. <laughs> that, that's a long, long story. Actually, I started to teach English as a second language when I was 16 in China. <laughs> I, uh, I, I learned um, English like in school when I was third grade. Uh, fourth grade and uh, my English teacher was not very good and she was like a Russian uh, language teacher and she switched to English but her English was not very good and uh, we um, had a radio program um, and the teacher from radio program was very good at radio at that time like very few TVs but just radio um, of course, the country would like put the best teacher in a radio program free to public. And uh, my mother was a school teacher and she encouraged um, all of us to learn English from the radio program. And my brother and sister dropped after two weeks. I persisted um, for like three, four years, uh, 30 minutes with radio. And then when I uh, 
finished my middle school, not even high school, when I was 16, um, I was given a job to teach English in an elementary school. And, and then I um, passed the entrance examination for um, college and I uh, took English language and literature as my major. And that was more than 30 years ago. And my, well, I don't know how much I should say. Uh, so uh, in my college um, in Shanghai, we had a uh, professor from Canada. Uh, she was from University of Toronto. Uh, when I got a scholarship to study abroad, she actually invited me to study uh, sociology and education in University of Toronto. So actually I, I left Beijing and went to University of Toronto to study sociology with Canadian students. And I got my master in University of Toronto for like after two, two years. Um, and of course now um, I've been in the North America because I had to count um, um, Canada longer than um, I longer than I spent time in China. So I'm, I consider myself as totally bilingual and bicultural. And right now I teach uh, DP Mandarin class, DP Mandarin in a, a IB school in Dallas. I came back to teach Mandarin. Um, yeah. I wish you would teach Mandarin to me. I took 10 weeks of, in an evening class at Moraine Valley Junior College, <laughs> and I only remember a few phrases. <laughs> but, um, okay, you listen to a radio program, yeah. but you got, I mean, the Chinese alphabet is so different from the U.S. alphabet or the English alphabet, and so there's so many parts to learning English, uh, another language, and comprehending and reading are other parts. So how did you get uh, English language without very much of an accent? Well, there are a lot of people who are bilingual. I mean, it's not that unusual. There are a lot of people who are bilingual and tri trilingual. It's the it's the practice it, it, practice that make make makes perfect, right? Right. Um, I mean, I've been here for so long, and I always like in an educational environment, and I have to teach, so it's just practice. Thank you. All right, Charlie. I think you were next. Yeah, Deanne, uh, anybody who's ever grown a simple house plant, uh, petunia, is able to perceive that the leaves are spaced so as to each collect an equitable amount of sunlight. And if I go outside of my backyard at night and I look up in the sky, I think I'm going to see a big round ball, a sphere. If I look at my telescope, I'm going to see them all over the universe. Now, you guys come along and say, well, there's geometry in nature. And you're claiming this is a discovery of some sort. Now, there certainly are degrees of complexity, but uh, that's barely evident to even the casual observer of Charlie in his backyard. So what's your question? Well, wh what's the excitement about geometry is easily recognizable. What's, what's, what's so unique about these fractals? <laughs> I think what's what's interesting about fractals and what's interesting in Blake's poem is the realization of of you can see 
a very mundane part of the world. And you, your mind can transcend the mundane to the divine. Divine in the sense of the whole cosmos. So even a leaf, a flower, if you don't think about it, you just see it is an isolated piece of work, piece of nature. But your realization of a sand, a leaf, a flower, a star is so, you can see this, a little part of the nature or human and how interconnected we are in the whole universe, then you have transcended from your isolated self and isolated perception and you merge with the cosmos. And that is almost to an extent, a religious experience. A yeah, slow down a minute, slow down. If every scientist in the world takes a grain of sand, puts it in their microscope, and according to you, it's perfectly fine if they all see something different. Well, I think we're gonna have a little bit of a problem now, saying that each of these are accurate, right? Human mind is uh, so. I give another Each of those talk. observations are I, accurate, actually. Right? Uh, I I give another talk that says I was from I was a atheist to uh, a, a agnostic and to a mystic. So so being a mystic, I I find like I'm not like denominationally religious, but I am spiritual and a mystic in the sense that it opens your vision to see the wonder of the world and to want to uh, appreciate instead of knowing, knowing this is true, this is not true, this is true, this is not true. And what is great about it? That's a jump. In a way, you can say that's a that that that's a mind trick, mind game, and it could be, but actually to be authentic, that's a choice I made. I I, I made a choice to seek the truth in interconnectedness and the wonder of the universe and not in the, in the track of wanting to find everything as true and false. Well, can I get a follow-up? Sure. Galileo looked to his telescope and he saw the world, the planets, the universe, and that was sufficient for him. And he didn't have to transcend anything. He said, this is remarkable. And the universe in and of itself was of sufficient magnitude. I remember reading this to him and he said, that's all you have to do. It was- Charlie, fractals are just a little bit more of the, of the discovery of the universe. And it's- Exactly, well, that's what I'm saying. You don't, the discovery of the universe in and of itself is sufficient. Yeah. What's its transcendent part? Well, there? Charlie, I think she's referring to the interconnectedness of ideas and uh, fractals and, and what, what, you know, the thing is, I know I've known about fractals and there are good mathematical phenomena and how nature constructs stuff. And I think for- uh, Tim, uh, there's no connectedness of ideas if everybody is seeing something different. There's the absence of connectivity. That's all. Well, I think the scientific method proves you wrong on that score. Well, you did you, so so uh, go and watch that TED talk 
um, by by this uh, scientist, and he also linked uh, William Blake's poems with fra fractals, and there is a co connection to to some people. So it just tells you that our mind can perceive and understand the world in a different way. So I'm not saying that um, my way is the only right way, that that's what I think there can be multiple truths. I acknowledge that your perception of the world holds true for you and my perception uh, holds true for me and they could be different ways of perceiving the world. And, uh, and that makes the world more exciting because we see um, same world uh, differently and you just uh, not trying to convince there's only one way of seeing it. Okay, Tim, I have a question. Go right ahead, Bob, and let's get something for Jan Lee. Okay, uh, Jan, um, are you are you troubled by uh, all this new uh, wokeness going on in the United States and this uh, this movement here to cancel uh, authors, great authors like Blake and Frost and Shakespeare, uh, simply because they're they're white and um, and does this at all remind you of the Cultural Revolution at all? I've heard that uh, Chinese parents are calling their children that are studying in the United States, calling them back home, thinking that this is like, they're, they're saying this is a cultural revolution going on in the United States, and they're calling them back home. Uh, so I'd like to get your opinion on all that. I think that's a very fringe um, theory, and that's a very fringe calling it's not not going to happen i mean people have extreme views um shakespeare william blake um these are uh i consider as classical um classical uh writers and cl classical uh literature and being classic that means that it has um it has a value beyond um politics and time and space because it uh, embodies uh, beauty and wisdom. There are people who uh, who want to ban, actually there are more people who want to ban um, the, uh, what, what was that series of books by the British author, Harry Potter. Oh yeah, yeah. So there are more people who want to ban Harry Potter than Ben William Blake. I have I, I have hardly heard anyone want to ban William Blake, but there were people who want to ban um, Harry Potter. So they are just like uh, different, narrow-minded uh, people who want to ban this kind of books. But it's highly <laughs> unlikely, highly improbable that Shakespeare and the uh, William Blake book, books will be banned. It's, it, I think we don't have to worry about that. I don't think it's going to happen. Well, I think there's, I think there's a movement afoot to, uh, uh, you know, remove a lot of their material from uh, required college reading lists. I'm not really yeah, aware of it. Really I think, so my point of view is instead of removing the classics we should add we should add some other uh writers who are um great uh, writers from african americans asian americans uh, we should enrich our knowledge not by withdrawing the great literature we should add it's like there was a debate of like uh, speaking English as if speaking Spanish or Chinese will make us less American or make us dumber. We should believe in human potential of learning more, not learning less. So in terms of language, like in Europe, in Asia, most people speak more than one language, two languages. So what's wrong of knowing more than less? Why should we take out great 
writers, why should we not add more? If we only read Shakespeare, only read uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, writers, uh, excluding other traditions, then we are narrow our own thinking. So, so I would think it's better to read more broadly rather than to retreat, right? In a world that, that is more um, interconnected, we should take opportunity to learn more, not to learn less. What do we gain by learning less? We have a lot to gain by learning more cultural traditions and great literatures from all over the world. I think there's a article in uh, City Journal. I've not read it yet, uh, but there was an article in the recent issue of City Journal, and uh, it's about what's going on in the world of classical music. And the same thing's going on over there. There's this movement to, you know, curtail performances of classical uh, music, I believe is what the, just, I just I kind of read an introduction of the piece or something, read a little bit about it, but I haven't read the whole article yet. But same thing's going on, you know, in, in music that this is, they're saying that, well, you know, this is, this is white supremacy and, you know, they have to, you know, quit, quit teaching this and start, uh, you know, and performing it and start, you know, teaching and performing all these, all these other artists. In other words, you know, we're going to start, uh, we're going to have to start listening and reading uh, material by people based on the color of their skin or their sex and not on the quality of the work. It's, that's, that's kind of my fear. Uh, so so there, there is a danger. There is a danger of so-called identity politics. But on the other hand, that uh, we do need to reflect and to be more inclusive. So if, if in a college for a literature uh, program and uh, all you read 100% is white Americans or Anglo-Saxon, 100%, isn't that to be remedied instead of 100%? See, think about history and the population. How many Anglo-Saxons percentage wise are in the world? It's less than 25%, I would think. And uh, what about civilizations? Civilizations, the four great civilizations, uh, Greek and a Roman is one of them, Ch Chinese, um, um, also one, one of them, right? Um, Hindus, the in Indus Valley, um, there's um, the, the um, Euphrates, the Middle East, there are many civilizations and there are many great authors. How many authors do you know who are not Anglo-Saxon? If you cannot name even one that's non-white, isn't that something to be remedied? Shouldn't we know more than just Anglo-Saxon, just white? So my argument is not for, for less and not wanting to read classics. My argument is we need to open our mind and read more in addition to the great um, Shakespeare. Um, we need to know something else from other civilizations. Only by learning more and enrich our knowledge, <laughs> we be more connected and have meaningful dialogues with people from other parts of the world. So okay. that's the case of not thinking just to our force, but rather to expand that there are many truths, there are many great literatures that we need to be aware. I have a quick question. Uh, where do you teach now, Shion? Uh, I teach in Alcorn School. At where? Alcorn. Oh, how wonderful. That is a wonderful place. My other 
a question or comment is simply that I think, uh, yes, there's been some concern that uh, we were going to eliminate people like Shakespeare and Beethoven and so on. I think our greater danger, this is my opinion, is critical race theory eliminating that, not telling our young people the truth or presenting it to them. So we've got a lot of little politici politi politicalizations going on and just have to guard against them and protect our culture and what's good for our people. And they need to know more rather than less. Yeah, so, so the argument is actually to know more uh, instead of knowing less and not say we can't do this, we can't do that, but we should say that in addition to this, we should do this and that um, because we are more and more interconnected. Like when I was in China, I was reading William Blake's, I was reading Shakespeare, but how many of American students who have read anything from Asia? I know Chinese classics. My daughter could recite ancient poems, Chinese poems, when she was three and she was born in the United States and she now speaks three, four languages. Um, I mean, this, we should think what we can do more instead of we are so afraid that we do less and less, right? So, um, but if we only know every piece of literature, every piece of music that is Anglo-Saxon white, is there something that we should reflect? Is that enough? Shouldn't we expand our horizon to know more? Otherwise, how can we have a meaningful dialogue with people from other parts of the world? And not being ethnocentric, thinking we are the center of the world. And that's what the Chinese used to think that, that they are the center of the world. Actually, Chinese Americans are most likely to be the most ethnocentric people in the world that think we are the center of the world. But the earth is round. No one is the center of the world. And we have to have humility to acknowledge that we are part of the world. We're not the center of the world. So we have we should have incentive to know more of the world. You're muted, Tim. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, thanks. Uh, several members of our audience have asked that you share your email in the chat, like Michael Kazanjian and a couple of others, you know, just just because they're so intrigued by your ideas. And before I ask you to share in the chat, would you mind doing so? Just so that they could get in touch with you. Um, you know, I've, uh, any other, when she's, uh, when Jian shares her email in the chat, is there any other people who've got questions? J-I-A-M? Yes. I -A -M. Can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, is that Jake on the phone? Uh, we can hear you, but uh, you want to speak a little louder? L I D L I. I'm sorry. You may have to unmute. Are you the caller from seven seven three four eight one zero five four four? Uh, speak a little louder, and then uh, you may be able to unmute your phone. I, I muted you because there was some background noise from you coming a little earlier. I think it's a pound six or something like that. Or, or whatever, but who's ever talking, um, we can barely hear you, but please uh, speak up a little louder. Or you can also type in the message box. That right, right, speak. right. I think he's on the phone though. And I think, is that Jake? No, Jake is not on tonight. Well, who's on? Uh, who's on the call? Because <coughs> I'm trying to think. We're not. We're not hearing them at all. Well, they just logged off, and they're probably going to come back. Um, was that Doug or, or who else? Okay. Anyway, um, anybody else has a question while we're waiting? Uh, because if not, we'll go into rebuttals. 
and I've I've got uh, you know, Jeanne, you you uh, inspired me to go looking around the web for some poetry, and uh, sometimes in in learning particular aspects of poetry, I found uh, one that I want to share with everybody else real quick. Wait a minute, Tim. We're not in rebuttals. Okay. But if, let's stick official. Let's you, you're okay. You're okay. Let's, uh, let's, uh, all right. Any more questions? Yeah, right. I do. I got a quick one. It all right. William Blake is, was a prophet. I didn't think, I didn't know we've had prophets in, in centuries. All right, then Vicki, you go next. Okay, so yeah, so the word, so, so the word of prophet, actually it's from Wikipedia that said he was a prophet, right? So it depends on how you interpret the word as prophet. It's not like in a real religious sense of prophet, but someone who kind of think far ahead of his time. And this, and we, we just made this example of his poem about, uh, to see a world, world in a um, in a sand, and uh, and how the connection with the fractals, and when that TED talk was talking about fractals and relating to this poem, and uh, he said that's like three hundred years ago. Was it three hundred years ago? And and his poem also kind of um, segued, has some kind of connections and inspirations, like uh, with fractal, and that in a sense is a prophet. It's prophet doesn't mean like, like we're going to heaven, but someone who is uh, far ahead of his time. So that's a power of, uh, relig well, not religion, power of poetry and the power of philosophy that they, um, that, that their sayings can um, have far reaching influence in the history or uh, some people think it is. Um, I might like to become one. Yeah, so why not? Like if see, see we come back to like things that are true or false, once you'd have decided things true and false, it's very difficult for you to break the mold and to make progress. You already know it's true and it's false. So what? So what can you learn? But if you are thinking in poetic terms and philosophical terms, then your mind is open that you will break into new frontier. Sort of like Fifty Shades of Gray, huh? <laughs> yeah. That is that philosophically <laughs> or realistically, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of commenting because I'm looking at the uh, poster on the stairs that you have behind you and you have that yin and yang figure and all that type of thing. Yeah. And yeah. I know that's, that's essential to Chinese. You have the yin and you have the yang and it's all about yeah. balance. Yeah. Sort of like, uh, sort of like what you call, what is that? Uh, hi no, there's something else to... Uh, uh, uh -huh. I have you, another great painting. Um, can you see that uh, a friend made um, that uh, a religious symbols? There are seven religious symbols in one painting. Uh, you yeah. mean the, the one that says a unity strike on it? Yeah, a unity symbol that ha has Ooh, uh, I, seven I like religious that. symbols. I like that one. We, we can only see the bottom and a half just go up a little bit. That That's neat. And actually, it's made by a, a scientist that had a vision of how connected that huh. religions and symbols are. And you can see um, there's a Judaism, Christianity, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, even a Wicca. <laughs> no, that, that that is cool. I mean, you know, because I've seen stuff like that before, and it's pretty neat yeah. stuff. Yeah. But I've been... Uh, Okay, who else? Okay, Vicki, you got another question. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have tried to read non-Anglo-Saxon um, Asian writers. Unfortunately, I only speak, comprehend the one language. And so everything I'm reading is in translation. And I always wonder, most particularly in poetry, if I'm coming even close to 
you know, understanding another culture or what the author truly intended or, you know, I, it's, it's a real limitation, I think. Um, are not, no, many Americans don't know another language and unfortunately I'm one of them. At this oh, one, one of the, one of the uh, most translated Chinese text actually is both religion and philosophy is Taoism. And Taoism text uh, called the Dao De Jing, D A O um, T E C H I N G. I'll, I'll, I'll put in a, um, it has been translated for like more than, like they say, like second to the Bible. And it's very short. Um, and it's poetic and it's philosophical. Um, Dao Dao. Japanese writers were popular for a time, like Mishima and Kawabata. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I just put a, a text mm -hmm. that's uh, written like 2,000 years ago, but it's been translated to wow. versions. Uh, there are hundreds of versions, and you can find free text. And that's the yin and the yang symbol. Um, I have a uh, question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Dan. Uh, Sun, Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Yeah. Is that Chinese? Yeah, that's Chinese. I've read that in translation. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very good, I think. It's a very good description of fighting and um, yeah. um, philosophy and tactics and yeah. strategy of even speaking with people. Mm -hmm. Not only fighting, not only killing and shooting, and mm -hmm. I'm sure it was written like 900 years ago or something like that. Yeah, it's probably yeah. more than a thousand years. Yeah. Do you use the art of war in your interpersonal relations? <laughs> <laughs> All the time, Charlie, especially on the College of Complexes. Uh, <laughs> the best war is one where not a shot is fired. They, yeah. they, they say the art of war is a must read in a West Point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't read it at West Point, but I read it here. Thank you. All right. Who else has a, um, who else has a question tonight? You know, Gianna, I, I'm really, uh, really Why intrigued. Why don't we move on to rebuttals? Okay, we'll move on to rebuttals. You know, I, one of the things that kind of reminded me that really cemented some of the concepts of poetry was the one there's a very short video on video on uh, how haiku is constructed I'm going to share it real quick and then a couple of I'll be I'll keep the rebuttals to about five minutes each but I think this one just tells you a little bit about how haiku is formed and how how to remember haiku I'll share the screen and it'll it'll be somewhat familiar to everybody but at the same time i think it might uh cause a little controversial uh controversy with our subject so i'll share this video and then i have a couple of poems that i think might be really good for our crowd at the college of complexes so i'll share this short video first and then i'll do a couple of other short poems here we go going to explore the world of haiku we're going to explore the world of getting high. Cool. <laughs> Narrow but head, not high, cool, but the ancient Japanese spare hunting poetry called haiku. The haiku is a three line poem. The first and last line are five syllables. The middle line is seven syllables. A syllable, of course, is one sound, but head, so it's two syllables, <laughs> but and head. So now that you know that butt head, why don't you compose a haiku for the class? Uh, 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 okay, come on, butthead. I have to go to the bathroom. Don't be scared. You're blocking. Come on, butthead. Five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. It's easy. Make your haiku about something you know. What you did yesterday, for instance. Now your first line is five syllables. Come on. Uh, uh, that was cool. <laughs> okay. 
Next line, seven syllables. Uh, when we killed that frog. <laughs> okay. And the last line, five syllables. It won't croak again. <laughs> okay. That was cool. Uh huh. When we killed that frog. Uh huh. It won't croak again. Okay. Your turn, Beavis. <laughs> Okay, Beavis. Ha 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 ha. Ha ha ha. Mm, ha ha. Mm. Ha ha. Mm, uh, ha. Okay, great work, guys. You both get A's for this exercise. <laughs> da, 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 da. I just thought that okay, would be. Class. No, no, I'm sorry. I'll Today stop sharing here. To I just thought that would be a little bit of a humorous uh, divergence <laughs> on, 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 on how I remember the art of haiku. Here's a couple I found. There once was a candidate Trump whose voices, whose message rang clear at the stump. Vote for me, we, because I am me and everyone else is a chump. Humpty Dumpty called for a wall. Trumpty Dumpty had a great fall. Now all the grand wizards and folks PR men could never put Trumpty together again. And I'm going to share screen on a couple more here real quick that I think you might find uh, uh, pretty, pretty neat. Um, I'll, I'll share screen on this one here real quick. If I can, just give me a second here, please. Uh, hang on. Okay, here we go. An ode to nachos. Oh, nacho, so layered, so complex, yet so simple. Your hotness, gooey, like the blurred lines between love and infatuation. Your chips, imperfect, fractured triangles. When placed together, complete the puzzle of my soul. Your cheese, once a cold, uncaring block, drips golden, melting the walls around my heart. And my stomach, my plate is clean, but I feel dirty. <laughs> and then, of course, there's one more that uh, I think this might really uh, speak to some stuff here. If I can just get it up here real quick. It's going to take me a minute. I'll share the screen and share this last one again here real quick, if you don't mind. Uh, just bear with me for a minute. I'll get my uh, screen up again on this last one. Um, I, think, I think you'll like... Uh, a lot of people will relate to this one here on our, on our, especially on a subject that we're all quite. <laughs> Janice, I like that comment. Dirty sure is the word, Tim. Okay. Like I said, we'll all have a chance to do this after I do it. So please feel free to do this one. Okay. This one's a short one. It's called How the Grinch Stole the Free Market. All the folks down in Galt's Gulch like markets a lot, but the Grinch who lived in uh, who lived north of Galt's Grove, Gulch did not. The Grinch hated markets, especially free ones. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reasons. It could be his head wasn't screwed on right. It could be perhaps that his rings were too tight. But I think the most likely reason of all may his brain that is may may have been that his brain was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his brain or his rings, he stood there on the mountaintop, hating the things, staring down the cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm lighted windows below in the town. For all they knew, the folk down in Galt's coach below were busy now trying to sell high by low. And they'll say, it's beneficial, he snarled with a smear. Tomorrow they'll barter, it's practically here. Then he ground with his fingers, nervously drumming, I must find a way to keep markets from running. For tomorrow he knew all the guys and gals would wake up bright and early to the market they'd fly. And then, oh, they'd buy, they'd buy, buy, buy. And one thing he hated, they'd buy, 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 buy. That's gut scrunch. Young and old would all make a profit and they'd profit, they'd profit, and they'd profit, profit, profit. <laughs> they would start innovating and making money off it. It made him so mad he punched through the soffit. And then... <laughs> They do something he least liked of all. All the people of Gulch Gulch, 
the tall and the small would stand close together with no thoughts of raiding. They'd stand face to face and then they would start trading. They trade and they trade and they trade, trade, trade. And the Grinch thought this a peaceful exchanging. Then the Grinch thought this requires rearranging. Why for 50 years, I put up with it now. I must stop markets from running. Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat, and he made a Hayekian hat and coat, and he chuckled. What a Grinchy trick. With this cat and hook, I'll look just like Friedrich. All I need is a mustache, the Grinch looked around, but since mustaches are scarce, there is none to be found. Did that stop the old sure? Grinch? No. The, there's a little more that's not too long. If I can't find a mustache, a mustache I'll make. So he gathered supplies, and he sewed up a fake. And it stuck under his nose with a snake. And the Grinch said, I'm ready. Then he started down towards the gulch where the folk lay snooze in their town. All the windows were dark. Quiet snows filled the air. Everybody was dreaming dreams without care. And when he came to the first house in the square, this is stop number one, the old Friedrich hissed. And he stepped through the door, velvet glove on his fist. Then he walked right inside, didn't ring, didn't knock. Property rights are respected by folks who read Locke. Then he slithered and slunk, the legislation mad demon. Around the whole world, room, he took every freedom. Cigars, motorcycles, the schools and their guns. Freedom Ooh. to travel, he took every one. And he made regulations to stop them all. Grinches adore legislation. Then he slunk to the ice box. He took the trans fed. He took the raw milk and the sauerkraut bat. He cleaned out the fridge, took their bathtub brewed booze. Why, that even Grinch took their last freedom to choose. So he all so it all down with a heart filled with glee and now Grinch grin the Grinch for a tax on this tree and the Grinch grabbed the tree and he started to tax it when he heard a small growl like a rattling racket he turned around fast and he said who are you it was Dagny Dagny Lou Taggart who was not more than two the Grinch had been caught by this gulch daughter who got out of bed for a cup of cold water she stared at the Grinch and said, Herr Hayek, why are you taking our liberties? Why? Why? But the Grinch, that old Grinch who was so smart and so slick, he thought up a lie and he thought it up quick. Well, my sweet little tot, the fake Hayek confessed, there's a wee knowledge problem I have to undress. So I'm taking it home to my workshops, my dear, and I'll direct things up there and distribute them here. And his fib fooled the child that he patted on her head and he got her a drink and he sent her to bed. And then Dagny Lou went to bed with her mug he went to the chimney and planted a bug. So the last thing we took was their privacy right. Then he left with his grinchy heart filled with the light. And the one speck of freedom he left in the house was a crumb, even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other gulch houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other gulch mouses. It was a quarter past dawn and the gulch still in bed. All the gulch still a snooze when he packed up his sled. Packed it up with their freedoms, their hopes and their choices, their work, innovations, Inventions, their choice, their voices. 3,000 feet up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo poo, said the gulch, he was grinishly humming. They're finding out now why their markets aren't running. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. The Mars will hang open for a minute, and then the folks down on Gelt's Groach will cry boo hoo. There's a noise, grinned the Grinch, and I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started out low, then started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound did merry. It would, couldn't be so, but this was merry, very. He stared down at Gulch Grouch. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he took, and what he saw was a shocking surprise. Everyone down in Gulch Grouch, the tall and the small, was trading despite regulations and all. He hadn't stopped markets from running. They ran, somehow or other, because they can. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could this be so? It came without laws. It came without orders. It came without bureaucrats or walls on our borders. As he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore, then the Grinch sought something he hadn't before. Maybe markets, he thought, don't need regulating. Maybe markets perhaps should go on percolating. And it what happened then, well, in Gulf's Gulch, they say the Grinch's small brain grew the thighs that day. And one minute his brain didn't quite feel so tight. He whizzed his load to the bright morning light and rolled back legislation. And he himself 
the Grinch learned to exchange. Yeah, I can. Yeah. I, you know, I was kind of doing a little bit of searching on the web, and I thought maybe a little bit of sarcasm about oh, um, Tracy Free Markets might be a good one to uh, share yeah. with. You. You know, especially aggravate Charlie, I know that. So, you know, that'll, that'll be the end of my rebuttal because I thought it was uh, just some good stuff to share with the group. Yeah. Now, if you guys got some other stuff, it is rebuttal time. So, uh, please go ahead and share. <laughs> well, Janice, now is the time to comment. So, uh, Unmute and uh, start uh, what you thought, and uh, you know, keep going with the poetry. All right, who's next? No, uh, China didn't. She didn't um, mute. Unmute. Oh, me? Jenna, you need to, um, no, Jenna. She's all right. All right. I finally found myself, so I can unmute. Okay. No, it's just that. Um, you know, when Trump was president, he kept saying, oh, you know, the markets are great. Our economy is great. And so he didn't see the difference. Uh, but there is a difference because the economy is you and me. And that's what he left behind. Yeah. Well, do you have what else you'd like to say about poetry tonight, Janice, while you got the floor? Well, it's just that uh, Jean made me appreciate poetry. I've taken poetry courses, but never learned much. And she taught me a lot. Well, what'd you think of my little uh, little thing about haiku? Okay. Um, I <laughs> haven't wrapped my brain around it yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of my uh, Beavis and Butthead or some, I, I think that one of the most uh, comedy breakthroughs that was ever done by Mike Judge, but that's my own opinion. Maybe Tim, you ask everyone to submit a haiku before we meet next time. <laughs> maybe that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> or maybe we can do it now. Uh, who, okay, Charlie, I know you got your hand up, so go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. All right. Um, I'm gonna lower your hand. All right, uh, first of all, we neglected to thank our speaker uh, for a nice presentation. Yeah, you're right. I forgot to put that in there. For our format. Nevertheless, was... thank you very much. Thank you. For the time and effort you put into this program and for sharing us uh, the links, the various sites and your insights. I'll be eclectic as usual here. First of all, a little note about Mr. Frost. Um, I realize he's considered a great American poet um, from New England, but he's actually from California oh. and he moved to England. And granted, he did resettle in New England, which I was going to do at one time in my life. Uh, but yeah, he's uh, uh, certainly a recognizable figure in the American literary literature community. Um, I, as I say, uh, I somewhat am amazed that he, along with perhaps even, well, is considered rustic. And I included a poem at the beginning, which in the Midwest, uh, the poets were trying to break away from this British mandate, uh, which I think Frost was kind of inclined to try to join, whereas the Midwest poets got into uh, the really authentic genre, as we would call it. Blake as well writes something about, I think he had, who was it? Frost has this apple harvest poem and I don't think it really captures uh, the rural character. I mean, I picked apples out of trees in my yard. And if you read that poem, it talks about the women making apple butter and so forth. I think that's true rustic authenticity of, 
uh, the American character. Uh, yeah, something about resting after picking apples. I, I kind of got lost and I said, this, this is about apple picking, right? But anyhow, that's just some of my literary, I'll leave it up to you literary types to uh, <laughs> argue that about. The thing I'd really like to talk about is there something uh, we saw here, a great uh, a binary here between truth and beauty. Well, a few people really study it, but there's a subject matter called the intellectual history of the world. And it took several centuries uh, to separate uh, theology and establish scientific inquiry. Uh, there were no most notable figure like um, Francis Bacon in the 16th century. Uh, universities were relatively new and he replaced all the textbooks. Prior to that, every, everybody had studied only Aristotle, and he said no. Uh, and they introduced a new philosophy called empiricism. Uh, later, it came under developments in epistemology, how you arrive at truth. is one of the four uh, aspects of philosophy. Later on, they also use the term sometimes natural philosophy or logical positivism, fancy terms. But basically, um, they were establishing secular methodologies for arriving at truth. Uh, now, I'm a little bit amazed that the speaker wants to return to the previous uh, situation. Uh, I don't know if I really look upon that as a positive transition. It's the separation of, there were certain references there, which raised my concern, such as archetypes of creation. Uh, we have a big bang in cosmology, and I don't know if there's any room for archetypes of creation and the divine in the explanation. So, you can make a decision to pursue this humanism, uh, which is certainly commendable, but I'm more inclined, I don't know if we're gonna abandon the secular arrival of truth. I, I had to pick books for libraries uh, during my life, <laughs> and I tried to arrive at secular books, which had contained what I believe to be the truth. Uh, it didn't mean we're open to every conceivable explanation that comes along. Um, and last of all, I just wanted to talk about Asian philosophy and theology, which is very fascinating. I, I've taken courses in the Buddhism, found it rather interesting. Some of the other things, I can't say that I'm a Confucian scholar by any means, but uh, there is a little problem with some of the Asian philosophies. And it was best summarized, I think, by one of our long-term colleagues at the college and that uh, it, it has a tendency, Asian philosophy has a tendency to go in circles, it was stated. And um, certainly, uh, in that regard, I, I'd have to say the, the work done by the Western individuals is, is worthy of note. Anyhow, it's very good. Uh, certainly we have to consider the humanistic elements of the world. Uh, but as I say, there was some efforts made um, to separate the two intellectual traditions, and uh, they've been that pretty much apart uh, for a long, long time. Anyhow, thank you very much. Come again when you got another one in me. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Tim. I guess I'll go. 
Go right ahead, Bob. So, um, uh, so you know, rebuttals are you know can be a mixture of every a little bit of everything. I guess that's what this is going to be. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, something we talked about a couple weeks ago that's kind of topical. Let me get over to share screen and if I can find it. Uh, well, I'm hmm. Well, don't see it. Ah. Anyway, well, I was, what I was going to share is just the uh, Indiana, the Illinois Department of Health COVID statistics. They actually have a uh, they have a web page that shows the um, the number of double vaccinated people and the breakthrough hospitalizations of double vaxxed people and the deaths of double vaxxed people and the 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 statistics are just phenomenal of how safe these vaccines actually are the number of deaths from breakthrough infections of covid now this means people that have been double vaccinated and then for more and then for over 2 weeks and then still got covid and then died was 223 out of a total of 6,329,000, I think it was 969 people that had been double vaxxed. So that is 0.0035%. That's less than a half a percent. That's less than one half of 1%. So that's phenomenal. Now the number of, uh, hospitalizations of these double vax people was something like a thousand twenty three or something it turned out that is actually something like point oh that was like that ended up being point oh one six percent so you know the odds of uh contracting covid if you're vaccinated are so small i mean it's like it's <laughs> It's like it's it's an, it's it was ninety it was ninety nine point I believe it was like ninety nine three point three five percent chance uh, that you would not be even you know hospitalized that you wouldn't even get it and then if you and if you were you know if you if you if you died it was only like you know less than a less than a percent. It's really, uh, it's really quite phenomenal. So all this, you know, mask mandate and all that stuff, you know, that is just a bunch of malarkey. You know, resist it, don't do it. I saw uh, an Instagram ad from Pritzker today. Uh, you know, mugging for the camera, and then it uh, says, you know, I I believe that Illinois will be able to do whatever we put our mind to once this pandemic is over. And then it ends with a still picture of him wearing a mask. And then it says, you know, strong leadership in tough times. So what this pandemic is doing is letting, you know, all these blue state politicians mug in front of the cameras and the microphones, you know, get that name recognition out there, you know, in the press for as much as they can. And then when the pandemic is, is over, and it certainly will be over because it's this this uh, this this virus, this one that's going around now, this Delta variant, is a is a pretty quick thing. It, it comes and goes, you know, pretty quickly. So it's going to be over soon. And now they're all going to be taking credit for it when the uh, when it's over, and they're going to say, "Yeah, they're tough." You know, mask mandates. You know, you know, stop this. But you'll notice that uh, and actually, there was an article in the Tribune today too. Um, well, you know, there was a big, a big headline. COVID, COVID cases in Illinois up, you know, to, I don't know how many thousands, you know, per day, you know, it's a big alarming thing. And then you read down to the very bottom and like the fifth or sixth line from the bottom of this article, then it says that, you know, the almost all the cases are unvaccinated people. And same thing with the deaths. They're nearly all, all unvaccinated people. So all this is much ado about nothing. You know, and if, if people don't want to get vaccinated, that's on them. That's their choice. Okay, there are, there are you know, people have had bad reactions 
to the vaccines. If they don't want to take that chance, that's up to them. They can balance it. Now, I, I think they're making a mistake because I think the long-term effects of having COVID are worse than the potential long-term risk of the vaccine. But again, that's, you know, that is their decision. So, um, so this mask mandate stuff, I think it's a bunch of crap. And speaking of a bunch of crap, we're talking about today about global warming. So, you know, our, <laughs> our, uh, our famous president Obama, Democratic Party, who, you know, who's such a anti-global warming president that he, and warning, warning us about the rising sea levels that he bought a $30 million mansion on, on the ocean at Martha's Vineyard, and then threw a, and then threw a big birthday party. And there's people like John Kerry flying in on their private jets to attend. So now they're building the uh, Obama Library in Jackson Park in Chicago, and guess what they're doing? Cutting down 1,000 mature trees, 1,000 trees that could do a lot to help global warming cool the planet, but they're going to remove these thousand trees and create this snarling mess of traffic over there for this ridiculous, unnecessary library that's going to, you know, also, you know, harm global, you know, it's going to be bad for, uh, not only bad for Chicago, but just bad for the environment. So I thought I'd bring, I'd bring that up. They don't, they don't feel the, that a thousand trees uh, are worth anything, uh, so they have to build this monument to Obama. Um, now I did well. Well, Tim was reading that that long uh, poem. I I snuck over and started reading that City Journal article uh, by Catherine McDonald. And if you don't if you don't subscribe to City Journal, you can still read like you know twenty articles you know, for over some period, you know, for free. So it's in the current issue and uh, it's called Classical Music Suicide Pact. And it's by, uh, by an author who you probably have heard of her. I think her name is Catherine McDonald. Heather McDonald, Heather McDonald wrote this story. So uh, yeah, this is going on. So, uh, you know, so right after the George Floyd thing and all the calls for, you know, the end of white supremacy and blah, blah, blah. So now all these uh, orchestra companies are falling to their knees and they're publishing these apologies of how racist they've been and how we're, you know, blah, blah, blah. And matter of fact, in the New York Times uh, reviewer, uh, the classical music reviewer for the New York Times, Anthony uh, Tomasini, is urging orchestra auditions to no longer take place behind a screen because because uh, now colorblindness is now regarded as discriminatory because it favors merit over race. So currently, the the, the way things work in the classical music business is musicians when they audition uh they're behind a screen so the people listening can't see who they are and they pick these people based on merit and that's how orchestras are picked but uh, of course there's you know you hear a lot of you know jive in the in the press you know black musicians saying they oh yeah these places are racist that's why i didn't get picked and you know blah 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 so we're seeing this movement, you know, the to uh, to tear down uh, what really Western culture. This we I mentioned this to, in, in my question to Jan. I don't she didn't have time to get to it, I guess. But about you know is you know this new cultural revolution that we're having here and how it resembles what went on in in China. Uh, so this is a this, so I like I'm I'm all for uh, seeking beauty rather than truth, but. I noticed, like, I'm a member at the Art Institute, and uh, and I've noticed that all these cultural institutions, all the arts, this wokeness, this this uh, this big lie that America is a racist, white supremacist country, is spreading everywhere, and you're seeing it creep in into the arts. And not only are you know uh, classical authors being removed from book lists, and they're statues being torn down, all Western cultures and attack on it. 
uh, you're, you know, and you're seeing, uh, you know, we're going to see things like, uh, um, you know, like, uh, well, I noticed recently at the Art Institute, there was a photography display by, uh, an, I guess, an African photographer. And I thought, the, I thought the photography was pretty much crap for the most part. So I'm just going to assume that the, that this, you know, that the Art Institute now is playing the, you know, they're playing into this. It's like, well, they, yeah, we have to, we have to be diverse, you know, like we have to be, uh, you know, we have to have an office of diversity and inclusion. Now they've added belonging into that as well, into the mix. So now it's something like, you know, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And uh, so we're going to be seeing, you know, we're going to have this, we're going to have art by, by people of color, you know, forced down our throats, whether it's any good or not, you know. And so it's you know not not going to be on merit. Uh, you know, we're not we're now back to a uh, back to a, a racially based society where things are going to be based on race and not merit. And I think it's a, a big loss for everyone. I think we need to uh, we need to fight it. And I guess that's it. You should have gone and tried to find some poetry to back up your views, Bob. I'm. Uh, oh, I've got a. I, I did write a haiku a while back ago that I'll that I'll read. Please do. Okay, now people from not from Chicago may not might not understand this, but Chicagoans will get it. Oh yeah, it's okay. Um, socks, CDs, loose squares, get it all on CTA. No off-peak service. Bob. Uh, what that refers to is that you could, you know, you could get used to be able to get on the red line and you could buy, there would be, there were people selling socks. They would have these plastic bags of like white men's, if you know, crew socks, you know, white cotton socks. And for like, you know, five bucks, you could get like a bag of socks. I, that's, that's where I used to, I used to buy my socks on the, on the, I used to, on the, I used to buy them from a guy on a bus. They did the same thing on the bus. <laughs> You know, and they'd sell socks on the bus as well. well I, always, I never get to the store to buy socks. So one of these guys would get on the CTA and say, you know, bag of socks, feel five bucks. You know, I'd buy a bag of socks. And then loose squares, they, those are cigarettes. They sell, uh, they sell individual cigarettes in Chicago, you know, on the train. They walk them down the aisles. Socks, CDs, loose squares. Oh, and they sell, and they sell bootleg CDs. You know, they copy CDs and, and you know, sell bootleg CDs for like five bucks. So that's what that means. Socks, CDs, loose squares, get it all on CTA, no off-peak service. Because you, you can't buy any of that stuff off-peak because the damn CTA doesn't run off-peak, uh, you know, or the, or the off-peak service is so shitty you don't take it. So that's what that's about. So it's... Bob. Yeah. Where do you get this figure of 1,000 trees in Jackson Park? Well, that, that was an article I read in the Tribune today. Where do you... I mean... There's no forest down there. It's in the Tribune, uh, Charlie. Is in today's trip. I, I, I don't. Is this some hyperbole? Of the, the I, I know the eco people, friends of the parks, but there's no forest down there. Well, a thousand trees. There's, there's a thousand trees down there. Nineteen point six parks. A big place. I, I, I. That's just astronomical. Well, it is, but I, it's, it's, I'm looking for the article right now. It's in today's Tribune. It's, hey, Bob, you, uh, you, you mentioned something about the Obama Library in Jackson Park, and you uh, mentioned a big number. You said uh, some uh, there was something about it that amazed you. Uh, do you remember what you uh, said? Uh, well, that's, they're cutting down a 1,000 trees. There are wonderful oh, events oh. having a presidential library. Here we go. Breaking news. And um, science. Okay, so it was it was in the August twenty. It was in the August twenty Tribune. It was in the August twenty Tribune, and uh, here let me. Uh, About there are all kinds of events. I go to the other presidential libraries. C-SPAN is is just loaded with programming. That goes on at the presidential go. libraries. Okay. And so. to have one in Chicago is wonderful. 
Okay, so right here where my cursor is. Um, okay, so the group whose bid for an emergency halt to construction was rejected by a lower court is advocated for an alternate location in Washington Park and is argued in court that current plans were, will clear cut 1,000 mature trees, disrupt migratory bird patterns, and contribute to more harmful air emissions by snarling traffic. Right there, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah right, right there. And here's uh, the, and here's you the- You couldn't count, you couldn't find that many trees. One thousand fire, all of it. Trees, one thousand trees. I mean, it adds up, man. That's a big. That's a lot of acreage over there. It's not. You're not going to find that many. I'm sorry, Bob. Well, anyway, it'd be nice to have a presidential library in Chicago. I saw the one Darn right dedicated to. Uh, Dallas has the George, the Laura Bush library, I mean, the George and the George Bush library. And that was quite an interesting thing to visit when I was down there. Yeah, well, they could go nuke Woodlawn and stick it down there. They don't need to put it in Jackson Park you know, on the, the lake. The real thing about trees is you seem to miss is I follow the group in San Francisco and every tree in Chicago has been identified. They do a pretty good job regarding trees here in Chicago. Margaret, you look like you've been uh, faithfully going over some paperwork. About trees, man. Do you have a rebuttal, please? Nothing to rebut. I like those uh, poems that you all composed. I thought those were very interesting, especially about the Grinch. No, I, found I, thought, that one, I found that one on the web. Yeah. Really, isn't that interesting? I thought it was quite clever, but I loved it. I've, I've heard this is my second time to hear this presentation. As I said, I wanted to hear it again. I loved hearing Giants, and I'm always working on paperwork. I'm multitasking all the time in order to survive, Tim. No, no problem. Um, do you have a poem you'd like to share with us, Margaret? No, I really don't. Because <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm finding all kinds of stuff. Huh. Just creatively going through Google and. Uh, but I am delighted. I mean, I want that Obama library. I'm not in Chicago, so I don't know the uh, the uh, good reasons and bad reasons for the location. I, it was even in the Dallas Morning News oh, about it. tearing down, you know, chopping down a number of trees. But uh, that Obama library is going to be wonderful. There was controversy here in Dallas about the Bush Library. I know there were people who signed petitions, didn't want it. Uh, you know, and I've got his, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, but I've got his book on my coffee table. Uh, one, uh, I mean, it, it's about immigration and he's now gotten into art and he's illustrated this book and he's, he's very pro immigration and incorporating these people into our society so they can make their contributions. So every community's had controversies about loc probably about locating these presidential libraries. Well, anyway, I just I just found something. Uh, I I just googled poems about Donald Trump. <laughs> to pay or not to pay? That is the question. There once was a brash billionaire who couldn't afford decent hair. Vexed voters agreed. What a nation in need! But to pay the price, do we dare? <laughs> I wondered, uh, I wondered, Tim, remember, he did not go in Normandy to visit the graves of the fallen soldiers. And yes. he was raining that day. I kept wondering if it was because of his hair. I don't know. But, uh, you know, the one thing I do know, if you're talking about hair and Trump, look at Boris Johnson. the, the, the I know. There's Saturday Night Live back when Trump was in office used to do a charade on both of them. <laughs> they both have similar hair. You know, the thing, the thing is, it's uh, I think poetry just unleashes the creative juices sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. I've been to poetry reading nights and I've composed some stuff there myself. Good. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's there. So, you know, when my... Anyway, let's keep back in the rebuttals. I'm oh, sorry, oh, I diverged. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 one, one more short thing to mention, Tim. Um, the uh, I, I, I urge everybody to go over to YouTube and and 
watch the YouTube video of, of Robert Frost. Uh, well, it's not really him. Uh, it's him reading the poem, uh, The Road Less Taken, but it's him reading it. It's not a not a video of him reading it. It's, he's just reading it. There's just a still picture of him, but he reads it himself. And man, he's got a, a great voice. He just really, you know, puts punch into that poem. And I actually wasn't going to come to this last night. I, I come to this, come to this tonight because last week I asked him, yeah, what's, what's on the schedule next week? He says, Oh, Oh, po something about some poetry or something. Somebody's going to read poetry or something. I'm like, Oh God. You know, cause most poetry is most poetry is garbage. You know, you got to face it. Uh, most poetry is garbage. Some of it is no, it's, no it's not it, true. Some of it is really good. And uh, when I looked at the uh, schedule today, I just happened to be home today because it was so so hot, and I haven't been feeling well, so I had things to, to do. So I looked at the schedule and I saw that that uh, that it was concentrating on Frost and Blake. And I said, well, hell, I got to listen to this. This is actually before, especially before these guys get canceled. Because, you know, these guys' heads are on the chopping block. They're part of Western culture. You know, they're on the way out. This cultural revolution is out to destroy everything from Europe, you know, and, and Greece and, you know, and everything. So I thought I better, uh, you know, get to this uh, while I can. Not hey, go, to, go to YouTube and listen to, uh, and listen to Robert. And listen to Robert Frost read, uh, uh, you know, the road less taken. Listen, listen to him read it himself. It's fantastic. Margaret, where are you from? Uh, Zumi, Margaret, where are you from? She's from she's from Dallas. I'm from Dallas. Um, as as is our speaker tonight, yes. who teaches at a very prominent private school here that's so well respected. I'm so glad they've got you. Bob, Bob. There are minority poets who are well recognized. Langston Hughes is wonderful. And they're not going to cancel him. Well, I didn't say. I didn't say. Well, of course they're not going to cancel Langston Hughes. I didn't say. I didn't say. I didn't say minority po poets are garbage. I said most most poetry is garbage. You know, there's a, no. there's a sprinkling. That young girl was at the inauguration. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't listen. I didn't listen to that. Yeah, she was pretty good. Remarkable. Yeah. There, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Like I said, poetry can really uh, be in there, and especially when the lyrics to music and things like that. You know. Right. Right. Now, if you want to read some stuff that's out there, go go read some Bukowski. Since oh. you're so concerned about trees, I guess I can. <laughs> you to join my Chicago Greens? <laughs> Can I sign you up? <laughs> no, well, just think about how many trees will be taken down when you try to put up all those wind turbines. The greens, that's just a front. That's just a communist front. <laughs> <laughs> Do you all live in the city of Chicago, Tim and Charles? Well, I, I actually live in a town called Algonquin. It's about... Uh, 40 miles away from when we meet at the college. Uh -huh. I live right where that library is going. That's, your mic. That's what I mean. It's not like I don't go there. I, I go, what in the world are they talking about? It's largely an underused park. I, uh, I, uh, I, live in, I live in Indiana, I live in, I live in Indiana, which is Oh. I'm 25 miles away from Chicago. When I, now I'm, I'm kind of old now, but when I was younger, I used to ride my bike to Chicago very often. Uh -huh. And I'd ride through Jackson Park and I'd ride through all those trees. And yeah. I believe there's a thousand trees there. There, there you know. Yeah, yeah there's, there is. There's pathways. Tim, there. I yes. explored looking into the Chicago Greens, working on trees. And then I discovered that there was sufficient activity already regarding the trees of the city and did not we did not pursue it because it was not it was already done well so you go to the tree in front of my house it's got a tag on it a metal tag that's good but just imagine what, what, how many trees you'd be taking out when you fill those fields with solar panels. The major and thing is there that happens are in, in cities is that people have greenery on their front lawns. 
in certain portions of the city, you can pave this over with cement. They built a brand new home next door to me and the guy took out the lawn and put in cement. Oh. Now there's some other things. I have a close associate who's an architect. There have been efforts to try to get tree-lined streets. Believe you me, he met with incredible opposition. <laughs> he was trying to convince them uh, it's an area that they would increase property values. And even that was not enough to persuade people to put a tree in their front yard. They just won't do it. Yeah, you know how much trees cost, Charlie? <laughs> you can get a free tree by joining one of those, the Audubon or one of the, uh, the, the tree society. Uh, Kay Myers okay. used to give me one virtually every week because she was always sending them money. I said, Kay, you're already giving me 10 trees. I only got a backyard that's about 40 by 40. Yeah, but uh, you could probably, uh, never mind. I bet I. No, there it is. Okay. Bob Matter is shared. Yeah. Bob, what's that? That is, uh, that's Evanston, uh, that's Northwestern University. When you come in the arch, that's the entrance to Northwestern. Look at all those beautiful trees. Yes, I know. And yeah, I know. I've, I've been up there before. Got a lot of good looking trees. And if you've seen some of the. Uh, uh, How about we put up the poem? One of my favorite poems I send out uh, every year on tree day is uh, Woodsman, Spare That Tree. Well, go ahead and put it up, Charlie. Just find a screen and share it and read it. I got it. I'll read it. I'll say it. Woodman, spare that tree. Touch not a single bough. In youth it sheltered me, and I'll protect it now. Ooh, not bad. So here's here's a nice tree-lined street in Evanston. Look at those be big, beautiful trees there. Look at that tree in the guy's front yard. Uh-huh. Now, if that thing ever comes down, he's in big trouble, but uh, <laughs> any of those, but uh, yeah, that is what you call a tree line street. Those are some mature, mature trees, but you know what? There's, you know, in that neighborhood, there's lots of trees that big that are like three, four feet around. These, these are, these are serious trees. They're beautiful. Yes, I know that one, uh, you know, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff and I mean, environmentally we like tree cover they say there's more trees now than there was even 100 years ago in, in illinois and across the prairie if you know what i'm saying and uh there, there's just a lot of stuff i mean like i said there's a lot of good stuff happening just imagine what's going to happen though when they take those uh take those old trees and fill it fill the fields with solar panels and wind turbines you know mm -hmm. just imagine the destruction to the environment we'll see at that point mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, like I said, I'll be speaking about this next week. Right. All right. Right. Okay, Janice, uh, Margaret, I know you guys are going to want to go on about plastics. <laughs> I've got to go, but I agree that plastics are terrible. But how do we live without them? I, I'm looking forward to next Saturday night. See you all. Bye bye. Oh, no problem. Bye bye. <laughs> There's a, there's a whole bunch of poems about plastics on the web, too. <laughs> well, there is something that we can do about it. Um, how many of you bring your own shopping bags, reusable bags, to grocery stores? I do. Well, I've been doing it for a long time. So I was, it, so I was it doing it before it was cool. Uh-huh. So that makes a little bit difference than, um, like, complaining that, each of us can do something, um, bring your own reusable bags. So whether it's uh, 
plastic or if it's uh, um, paperback. Like I go to Trader Joe's a lot and I always save the Trader Joe's um, brown bag and I would bring that. So um, little by little that we actually by our action make a little bit difference. And about 25 years ago, I purchased a backpack from an army surplus store that was made for the Chinese army. I bought two of them and I don't drive. So I have to carry my groceries home that way. But I have been using those two bags wow. for that long and they are of such quality. And I have other backpacks. I'm a, I was a backpacker. So, but those are by far and away the best uh, I've seen. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, uh, I've, I've been a bicyclist for, you know, a, you know full-time uh, transportation cyclist for, for over 20 years. And uh, so I usually have a, a backpack or, or panniers with me. And I would just, you know, or a messenger bag. And I would just, you know, I'd go to the store. You know, usually I just, I, I'm single. I don't have any children or anything. So I would just use one of their little hand baskets usually. And I'd buy, you know, a few days worth of groceries. And then my local supermarket has, has had a program for a long time called Save a Sack, where they'd give you five cents off your bill if you brought your own bag. So I always had, since I always had my backpack with me, I'd always remind them to give me the save a sack discount. So I always saved a nickel every time I went to the store and they'd put my stuff in my bag. And I've been, I've really been doing that ever, you know, ever since, you know, I did it, did it today. I went grocery shopping today with a free backpack that I got from where, a place I used to work back in 2006. So this bag has been around been 15 years old is sort of my dedicated grocery shopping bag. But, uh, you know, I'm, I am getting old. So I mentioned, I imagine sooner or later, I'll be switching to a cart. Now I'm close enough to the store where I can walk. But, uh, but I often do ride my bike. Now today I did ride my bike, but, uh, but sometimes I walk just for just to change it up a little bit. But I saw, uh, I saw a little old lady today walking with one of those pull carts. And I was thinking like, yeah, I think I'm going to get me one of them pull carts. Well, I, uh, the only thing that's hard to bring home is a watermelon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I never, I've never brought one home. I don't think. <laughs> or you just go to the grocery store and take a cab home, or free grocery delivery now. Yeah, that that that's nice. I I um I changed my car. I um used to have a Mini Cooper. It looks really cute but it only like 25 miles per gallon. And now I have a Toyota Prius, it gets me like 50 miles per gallon. So it, it's like more than double. Yeah, um, no, those Priuses are good. Hey, so Bob. Save gas yeah. and, and it helps the environment. So I don't, <laughs> uh, I thought uh, Mini Cooper was cute, but it, it was small and it, it really um, used a lot of gas. Hey, Bob. Yeah. In one of the bags I use for my groceries is one that I bought at the, the gift shop of the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and big and durable. Yeah, well, the thing is, all right, at this point now, since we're kind of running out of rebuttals, I'm going to end our meeting tonight, unless anybody else has anything to say. GN, you get the last word before we stop recording. Uh, if you have anything to say real quick, now is the time to say it, and I'll stop recording. We can keep talking for a while. Okay. Well, um, thank you for um, having me, and thank you for your um, com comments. I, As I said, um, I think sometimes it's uh, a good idea to uh, shift our attention from um, seeking truth to seeking beauty and to be comfortable with 
something that's kind of ambiguity instead of seeking for certainty. Um, now, like in, in my school and in uh, other places, I've heard like we need to uh, switch to a growth mind instead of a set mind. Uh, asking questions and um, try to see uh, issues from both perspectives instead of um, just believing there's only one answer um, in terms of like the literature uh, um, that some people want to see certain literature to be included or not included. Uh, my view is that we need to um, have different kinds of literature and our classics um, is here because they, uh, they are profound. Um, but it doesn't mean that other books that you haven't read, they are not worth reading. So we, I think it's a good idea to keep an open mind and to respect different uh, cultures and different traditions. Um, having more perspective and uh, more dialogues going on will help us to be a more rounded person and help society to be a more um, inclusive and a more hopefully um, more pleasant for different kinds of people. There are always things to, to learn, um, not exclude, but to include and expand. The more that we can include and expand, the more we grow and it's better for us as individuals and it's better for the society. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording now and we'll keep the Zoom call open. So thank you everybody for attending and this will end our official proceedings. Okay, hang on here.